Good morning. Good morning. Again. And, uh, and welcome again. Do we have any, um, any uh, postdoctoral theologians in here? You know, I have gotten into uh, some uh, discussions with people in the past about some theological issues. And uh, what I found is that there's never a win in those arguments. Because for every verse I can find to support my position, somebody can take um, a competing verse because it's normally out of context in order to, uh, um, to support their side or to contradict what I'm, what I'm saying. And then what we do is we get into an argument. I remember uh, growing up, I was raised uh, Jewish. My grandfather was Orthodox, and uh, I remember spending um, Friday nights Yom Tov sometimes at his house, and the uh, Rebbe's, he lived in a Hasidic neighborhood, which is an ultra-Orthodox sect of Judaism, and, and the Rebbe's would come and, at my grandfather's house on, on Yom Tov on Friday night, and, um, and they would argue until 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, I remember, uh, I don't remember a lot of what they talked about, but I do remember one night listening to them arguing about how was it that Noah was able to get the dinosaurs onto the ark. And, and some were of the opinion that he actually put them on the top of the ark and they fed them through the windows. Now, I don't know a lot about dinosaurs, but I think they eat a lot. And I don't know, I had this picture of grabbing handfuls of hay and handing it through the window, hoping that that's all that it would take was the hay and not, and not your hand. And I believe that, that God does not, does not um, uh, encompass, or our lives and our relationship with God does not encompass a spirit of argument. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have discussions and even spirited discussion sometimes about things because I think we learn from that. We have to not, this is, um, religion is not just a, an emotional, um, an emotional construct. It is an intellectual construct as well. We need to be intellectually invested into the Bible and understanding things like the spirit of prophecy and the, and the, the message of the, of the, the, um, um, the sanctuary and, and others because when when the emotional parts begin on a roller coaster, when we're in fear or we're, we're sad or we're overexcited or whatever, um, we can get into a place where we lose our rational ability to consider what it is that the Bible teaches us. So I think there's an intellectual part, and we get that through study. We don't get it from sermons. We don't get it from someone getting up here and telling you what their thesis is for the day. We get it through hardcore Bible study, uh, both in groups and individually, and reading literature that has been written by people who, who also have a gift of being able to uh, communicate that. Um, what I have found, though, and I know I've, I've talked about this on, on many occasions, and I'll do it again, is that nobody can argue my personal testimony. Nobody, well, I guess if you want to be really that, um, that um, argumentative, thank you, that, that you could say, well, that's not true, you didn't really experience that. But at that point, I would normally disregard everything else that a person would have to say because we can't deny a person, anybody else's personal experience. Whether it's a positive experience or a negative experience, it's their experience. And so personal testimony becomes such a powerful witness because it's no longer getting into some theological, intellectual argument about some verse or line in the Bible. You know, did God really say to Peter that now you can eat everything because it's clean? Or was he talking about the fact that the Gentiles and the Jews, there was, there was no difference there, that we weren't to reject them? And, and you know, you're going to hear it 
both ways. Whether the Sabbath is, is truly the Sabbath to be kept or whether it was nailed to the cross, even though the other nine commandments seem to still be in force in most churches. You know, and, and whatever. So, so I don't think there's ever a win in those types of discussions. So it's been my experience that when I tell people what my personal testimony is, they can take it or leave it, but there's really not much to argue because it's my testimony and it's what happened to me. Acts 1.8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall witness to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So I think the first question that we run into and a lot of people ask this, is why me, Lord? Why am I being singled out anyway to give a testimony? Um, people don't necessarily enjoy giving their testimonies, particularly in public. I heard it once said that uh, the number one fear, the number one greatest fear of a human being is what? Speaking in public. And, and what's the number two fear? Is dying. So I heard someone say once that most people would rather at a funeral be in the box than delivering the eulogy, <laughs> basically. And so, and, and, and some people don't like to give a testimony because they're afraid of what, what the, the response might be. But the question comes, why does it fall on me? And to me, that goes hand in hand with the question of why do we suffer? Why do bad things happen to good people, right? Why is it that we suffer through illness or injury or pain or financial issues or emotional issues or whatever. And the Bible tells us this clearly. And it's in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 5. <clears throat> it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation. Now why? So that we may be comfortable Right? It says he comforts us in all of our tribulation. That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Think about that. We are comforted by God in our tribulations so that when we see someone else going through the same tribulation we were, that we are able to comfort that person with the comfort we got from God. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, I, I remember um, being at a, was a prayer group or something one time, and, and this lady had been uh, sexually abused for years by her father and her grandfather um, when she was a child growing up. And she was a drug addict and an alcoholic and had been engaged in prostitution and because she just, it so messed her up, and I got that, you know. It, it was such a bad experience that she just couldn't find her way to God anywhere. And she was in this group meeting and she was sharing about this. And there was a lady there who uh, was one of the people leading out in this meeting who had also spent years of sexual abuse by her father and her grandfather and other male members of the family. And she got through the other side and she was a strong Christian woman. And it was her personal testimony. It wasn't somebody getting up and opening the Bible and saying, well, here's what the Bible says about that. It was this lady speaking to the other woman about her personal testimony. I've been there. I've done that. I got the t-shirt. And here's, here's what Jesus did for me to comfort me so that I was able to come through the other side of that. That is why we are comforted. In fact, I believe that's why God allows us sometimes to go through these tribulations. Job did nothing wrong. Right? Job was there because it was a witness. It was a testimony to the rest of the world. We continue to read about that every day. We have to have the heart of a witness. We have to have the heart of a testimonial person. Right? So it's not just an understanding of, of some basic understanding of the gospel message, which is usually weaved into this testimony, but it's also that our hearts are open to be able to share that with another person. And that's not easy. 
It's not always easy for us to do. Um, we continue on in 2 Corinthians 5, 20 to 21 says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. What does that mean? What's an ambassador? It's a representative, right? So we have an ambassador to the Ukraine, to Ukraine, let's say. That person is a representative of the United States to that country, and they represent the U.S. and our values and our principles to the people of that country. So if we're ambassadors of Christ, that means that we represent Jesus Christ. In, in, in sense, then, um, in, in that context, we, um, we, we should be able to communicate the character of Christ to other people, not just through our words, but through our actions and, and through our relationships. It says God is making his appeal through who? Us, right? We don't, Jesus isn't walking the face of the earth right now. If people are going to get the salvation message, if they're going to get the message of the love of Jesus Christ, from whom is that going to come? It's going to come from us, right? And I'm not saying that Bible study is not important. I'm saying that we don't use the Bible as a weapon against people, as a hammer to hit them over the head. We use our personal testimony, which is a result of our personal relationship with Christ. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Have any of you ever said that to anybody? We were at a big conference one time, Susan and I, big medical conference. And um, uh, it was, I was speaking at this conference on some topic on statistical modeling or something in, in healthcare. We were doing some research, talking about some research. And we, we sat at these big round tables. There was probably 10 people uh, to, to a table. And, and um, I always try to weave in a, something a little bit about something about my beliefs into my secular talks without, without sort of violating the agreements that I sign that I won't turn it into a sermon. And, um, and as we're at the table, there was this young man sitting on the other side, and, and he, he looked across the table. How did he put it? He said, you're seven, aren't you? Oh, he said, you're, you're a seven, aren't you? And I went, <laughs> what? And he said, a seven. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And Susan, which is what normally happens, tells me, gives me the sense of what's going on. He's, he's saying you're a Seventh-day Adventist. I said, oh yeah, I am a Seventh-day Adventist. So obviously the message got through somehow in that talk, and maybe because I had, we had vegetarian meals, everybody else was eating bloody steaks and all that. And, um, and he said to me, yeah, I used to be, I used to be a Seventh-day Adventist too. Was his dad a preacher or something like that? He grew up in the dorms, yeah, at Southern, and he used to be an Adventist. And, and I said, well, time to come home. Maybe it's time to come home. I don't, don't you guys have that where you've talked to people who, for whatever reason, have lost their faith? Something's happened to them. They've lost a loved one or we in this crisis or, or some terrible thing occurs. And, and they're like, how could God allow this to happen? And their faith begins to waver. And there we are saying, hey, we've been through that. Time to come home. Time to come home. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. And if we don't understand that, if we cannot internalize that statement, then we are going to have a hard time projecting that sense of love and loyalty to other people. We just, that's something that we have to deal with first. Our relationship with Jesus has to be uh, in a strong place if we're going to be able to, to represent that character to other people. Listen to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 5. When I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom <clears throat> to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided that while I was with you, here's what he says, I added the emphasis, by the way, not the Bible, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. Right, Paul used to say, oh, I'd, I'd speak math to the mathematicians and philosophy to the philosophers and, and this to them. And then I, I'm like, what am I doing? Here's what I want to talk about. Jesus Christ and him crucified. <clears throat> he says, I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling. And my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so that you would not trust in human wisdom, but in the power of God. 
So I'm not going to give you a self-help story about me. I'm going to tell you that I, there is no self-help for me. That the only reason that I came out of that, that um, bow of death bond is because of the Lord. That's it. And there is no other explanation for that. And you don't have to believe me, but you're wrong, which is cool. You're entitled to be wrong, but that's my testimony. So how powerful is our testimony? Well, John 4, 28 to 29 says this. It says, Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Right? The woman at the well. And Jesus tells her all about her life. And she goes to everybody. Here's my personal testimony. She said, I'm not telling you about this guy. I'm telling you about me. He told me everything about me. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what? The woman's testimony. Not because she was picking up the scriptures and reading from Isaiah. They believed what she had to say because maybe in those days people were more honest and trusting. I don't know. But if somebody spoke about an experience, apparently other people believed them. He told me everything I ever did. Okay? And here's what our testimony is supposed to do. It's not supposed to be self-aggrandizing. We don't inflate it. You know, you know the difference between exaggeration and hyperbole? In exaggeration, we expect people they might believe it. I might say that I was running late for church and I was doing like 100 miles an hour to get here. And you might think, wow, that's pretty stupid, but it's possible, you know, I could be doing 100 miles an hour. Hyperbole is saying I was really late for church and I was doing like 10,000 miles an hour to get here. I was flying. That's not expected to be believed. That is just hyperbolic in order to try to express or get the point across, right? So we're not to be hyperbolic or exaggerate. We're simply to tell our story and how Jesus has impacted our lives. And you know what the purpose of it is? It's not for us to be lifted up. It's for us to lift up Jesus and to bring other people to Christ, right? That's the purpose of any witness. John 40 to 41, let's continue on. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of what? His own word. But what was Jesus telling people? I know he was teaching in the synagogues, but he was giving his testimony. He did nothing without first relying on, on the Father, his relationship with the Father. It goes on in verse 42 to say, Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said. So let's go back a minute. <clears throat> and they said many of the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. It brought them to Jesus. And then they came and they said, hey, we now believe in you, not because of what she said, but because of what? Of what you said. For we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. <laughs> is that great or what? You know, but we don't have Jesus here on this earth to bring people to in the flesh. We are wholly dependent and rely upon the Holy Spirit. So we bring people to the Holy Spirit and we pray for them that they will get a connection. They will get an emotional and an intellectual connection with the Holy Spirit. And then they can say, hey, you know, Frank, I believe in this now, in the gospel message, not because of what you said, but because of what the Holy Spirit has done in my heart. Isn't that the goal, the objective of all this? It's not just that we do it, it is a responsibility, it's our duty to carry our own message. Acts 4, 18 to 19 says, so they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than uh, to God, you judge. But for us, they say, for we cannot speak the things which cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So what are they saying? Again, it's not teaching from the spirit of prophecy. It's not teaching from the book of Isaiah. They're not telling the story of Job. They're in there talking about what has happened to them, what they've seen and what they've heard, their own personal experience in their walk with Jesus. So, so here's the beauty of personal testimony. It removes the pressure of having to be a theologian, right? 
it takes away that stress of worrying about whether the person with whom I'm about to argue has more Bible verse knowledge and memorization than I do. I don't want to be in that position. John 4, 9, 24 to 25 says, For the second time they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this, because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. Right? It's the Pharisees saying this. No, no, no. You can't give Jesus the credit. you got to give God the credit, because Jesus is a sinner. Right? You know what they're saying here? Here's what he says. Yeah, well, I don't know nothing about that, he said, about whether this guy's a sinner, but I know this. I was blind, and now I can see. Who's going to argue with that? What are you going to say to him? Well, that's not what's important here. Yeah, well, <laughs> to the blind guy who can now see, to the cripple who can now walk, to the deaf person who can now see, to the person with leprosy who's all of a sudden their fingers aren't falling off, guess what? To them, that's what's important. It's not about what other people think or what other people say. I don't know whether he's a sinner or not. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't need to get into your politics. Here's the, here's the bottom line to it. I experience the benefits from that. So here's part of the problem. We have to be ready to give our testimony at any time. And, um, and I thought about doing testimonies today, but we're going to have a separate day where I'm going to get four or five people lined up in advance because it's unfair, and you know I've been reminded of that, to walk into church on the day and say, hey, would you like to go up and give your testimony today? And people are like, ah, I'd rather be dead in the box <laughs> than giving the testimony. But we're going to do that. We're going to set up a day, and I'm going to ask several of you who would be willing to do it if you would be willing to come up and give your testimony. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain you know why we can do that? Because we don't have to be a studied. Somebody says, hey, let's talk about this, uh, the sanctuary message a little bit. And you're like, oh, man, I haven't read that in a while. Or, or let's talk about the beast in Revelation or the, the, the big idol. And you're like, oh, man, I, I didn't go back to Daniel 6. I didn't read through that. But someone says, tell me about your testimony. And you're like, yeah, well, I can do that. I don't have to study that. If you do, if you've got to study your testimony before you tell it to someone, it's probably a lie. Okay? It's not your testimony. 2 Timothy 4.2 says, Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. So I'm going to give you a little testimony. You okay with that? All right. And because, um, uh, because Glenn's mother asked me about how it is that I, being raised Jewish, became a Christian, a Seventh-day Adventist. So I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to let everybody else kind of hang in and listen to our conversation. Because here's the way it happened to me. You don't have to believe it. You're wrong. You don't have to like it. That's your problem. But this is the truth. And what it was, was um, I had met um, um, a lady, and we were friends, and, and we were talking one day. She happened to be um, significantly more spiritually oriented than I was, and she was a Seventh-day Adventist. And we got talking one day, and we were talking about Jesus. And I said, yeah, Jesus, kind of like Abby Hoffman, you know, a bit of a revolutionary, out there to kind of change the world and, and start things off a different way, maybe move in a different direction. Definitely a good guy, but the Messiah couldn't be. Because every Passover, we would put out the Kos Eliyahu, right? The Elijah cup. And Elijah, like Santa does on Christmas, Elijah would come to all the Jewish homes and he'd take a sip of wine and we were waiting for him to usher in the Messiah. So the Messiah couldn't be here yet because it hasn't happened. And the truth is, I believe that because that's what my dad believed and my grandfather believed and all the rabbis and all the rabbis and all the highly educated Jewish theologians. And I was certainly no smarter than any of those people were by a long shot. So when I said that, this lady said to me, well, you're a pretty smart guy. So I imagine to form that strong of an, of an opinion, you've probably read through the Bible several times. 
And I went, well, <laughs> no, I actually never read the Bible. I read the Torah, but I've never read the Bible. So she handed me a Bible. And uh, I went home and I read the first four Gospels. It took about five or six hours. Read them straight through. And I was absolutely converted, probably halfway through. But I read the rest because I was so fascinated. And I was converted instantly. The Holy Spirit just set this message on my heart. And, and it wasn't an emotional response for me. I don't get tied up a lot in emotional responses. It was an intellectual thing for me. Here's four different people telling a story with no motivation to lie at all about this. There was no reason that they would have said things that weren't true. And the stories were very consistent in most cases. And, and, and what it said was that this man, Jesus, either had to be A, the Son of God, or B, Beelzebub. He had to be Satan incarnate. And I didn't believe that because even historically speaking, and I went and looked at some historical references, the things that he did are not being challenged. And my heart was turned. And, and, and that lady, by the way, I married her, that's Susan, who, who, uh, who did that. And uh, I called her up, I think at 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning, I woke her up. And I said, how could we have been so wrong? And she's like, us? We shouldn't be friends? What? I said, no, no, no. How is it that, how is it that my dad and my grandfather and all these Hasidic rabbis and rebbies, the Gamaliels of the community, who were educated at the feet of the scholars, how could they possibly have missed that one small detail that the Messiah had already come? And that was my conversion story. That's it. I mean, there's a lot to talk about that went on in my past, but that doesn't matter. Those are self-aggrandizing. Whether you're a bad boy or not a bad boy or whatever, that's got nothing to do with it. It's where were you when Jesus came to you? Whether you were a Christian for a long time or you're just starting out. That's what people want to hear from us. They don't want to know how smart we are. They want to know what, we, what our relationship is. They want to know what we've personally experienced. The problem is we don't always know the outcome. Right? Paul says, I plant Apollos waters and God brings the increase. Mark 4, 26 to 27. Mark, of course, which is our favorite book in the Bible. Right, Mark? That's right. Uh, it says, Jesus also said, the kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, but he doesn't understand how it happens. I went out to, the, to my little garden this morning and, and I'm replanting some of the seeds because we've eaten a lot of it and and i'm just fascinated by it i got these little matter of fact these seeds are so small susan said did you space them out a little bit this time I'm like how do you space them out they're so small that if even a bird flies by the wind blows the seeds everywhere so you just do your best to kind of so small yet we're eating lettuce in a meal from a seed that's so small and it's growing in dirt that's filled with worms and and I don't get it. I mean, I got the, the scientific concept, but I don't get it. I don't get how, how that actually works. But the truth is I don't have to. Because whether I understand it or not, um, nine weeks from now, I'm going to have another batch of lettuce to eat. There's a study that was done. It was the Institute for American Church Growth, and they asked I don't know, something like 13,400 people. Why do you come to church? What's responsible for your coming to this church that you come to? Uh, some people say, I visited there. Maybe they were driving through the area and, and they were looking up for a church or there were snowbirds looking for a church or something. Some people say, I like the Sunday school. Obviously, in our case, it would be Sabbath school. Um, someone said, I had a, uh, 2% said I had a special need. 3% just random. <clears throat> they just walked into the church, no plan, no nothing. They just walked in. 3% said they liked the programs. That's why they came back to that church. 5% was other. 6% came because they liked the pastor. That's it. Only 6% of people continue to come to a church because of the pastor. But you know why the overwhelming majority of people showed up at a church, 79%? Because they were invited by a friend or a relative. 
each one reach one. You want to grow the church? Tell people your testimony. What has Jesus done for you? And then ask those people to come with you to experience what you've experienced. So what say ye? Miss White, or this was in our Review and Herald. It says, ministers of Christ, <clears throat> what have you to say for yourselves? What soul conflicts have you experienced that have been for your good, for the good of souls and for the glory of God? Let's stop for a second. The question there is, what terrible things have happened to you in your life that you can use for good to help other people? People who have been through financial collapse are in a better position to help other people who have been through a financial collapse. People who have been through a divorce are in a better position to help other people who are going through a divorce. People who have been abused are in a better position to help other people who have been abused. I mean, it's just, that's just the way it is because we relate to the other person's experience. It's about empathy and it's about emotional intelligence, which I think we talked about last year quite a bit. Um, it says, you who profess to be proclaiming the last solemn message to the world, what is your experience in the knowledge of the truth and its effect upon your own hearts? It doesn't say here, how well versed are you in the Bible? And, and please do not think that I'm telling you that's not important, because it is. Bible study and Bible knowledge is critically important. Prayer groups uh, and, and Bible study groups are critically important that we can have discussions uh, and, and, and um, spirited discussion sometimes about what the Bible's trying to say. But, but the question is, is how does that affect us and our own hearts? Because when the message, when we have that opportunity to share the message with someone, we don't start with theology, we start with our experience. We need the emotional needs of these people, of, of people first. Uh, Zig Ziglar, I remember him, this thing I saw said that, People don't care how much you know until first they know how much you care about them. Will your character testify for Christ? Can you speak of the refining, ennobling, sanctifying influence of the truth that, as it is in Jesus? What have you seen and what have you known of the power of Christ? You know, I am far from perfect. I am um, probably less deserving of grace than anybody that I know. But I can tell you this, that I am not the person that I was before, and that is for one reason and one reason only, and that's because the Holy Spirit moved on my heart. That's it. Because I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm still Jewish. I haven't given up. I love Judaism. I love the holidays, and I love the traditions of Judaism. February 7th at our house, it's bagels. <laughs> All right. I'll pay for it for a couple days, but I, you know, I just, I love that whole thing. I love the whole spirit of, of what the, the history and the richness of the tradition of growing up Jewish is. I'm not giving that up. But, but, but there's just one little part of it. I realized that the Messiah was already here and that it's Jesus. And, and if I'm talking to other Jewish people, that's my testimony. No, I haven't converted to Christianity, although my mom might argue with that. I haven't converted. I simply found the Messiah. I finally came to realize the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Messiah that we've been waiting for for centuries, and he's here, and he's coming back, Amen. and he's going to take me with him. Amen. That's my testimony. How much more power could there be in that? And it guides my life now. 100% of the time, nah. I wish it did. But you know, I hate being human. It's, it's a handicap. I should get a handicap sticker. I should, be, I should be able to get benefits under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Why? Because I'm human. I'm, I'm held hostage by this little pea brain of mine that is, can only function within four dimensions. Even time I mess up. You know, Time zones, forget it. Waiting on a call yesterday for an hour, and they never showed up. I went back, I went, <laughs> Pacific time. <laughs> See, I wish we all went on Zulu time. That's how I did it in the military. Everything was on Zulu, then we're all in the same time all the time. In closing. Okay. Philippians 1, 27 to 30 says this. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, 
conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then, whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is what? The gospel message, the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed. But uh, this, right, but that you are going to be saved even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. And why do we suffer? So that we can use the comfort that we get to comfort others in the same suffering that we had when God comforted us. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past. You know that I am still in the midst of it. How many are still in the midst of it, of the struggle? You know, we, the, the mere fact that you are here means that you have a story to tell. The fact that you came to church today when you didn't have to, when you have every reason not to come during this whole pandemic scare, Every one of us has the perfect excuse to stay home, but you didn't. And every one of you has a story about what Jesus has done for you that you can share with another person without worrying about the theological implications of the argument. Don't argue. Just tell people from the heart. What has God done for you? Amen. Oh, wait, I just ended the whole, there'll be nothing left on the slide presentation. Um, Bonita, could you just sort of hit F5 again or somebody on the keyboard? Sorry, I keep clicking this, but I'm not looking at the right thing. And uh, we're going to do our, our closing hymn. Just F5. Just press F5 on the top. There you go. All right, so here's your challenge. I want each of you this week to tell one person your story. Don't make it the long, drawn out, well, when I was six kind of thing. What brought you to Christ? I mean, if that's part of it, I'm not saying don't do it, but, but think about what... If, Think about what would you want to hear from another person to help you be convinced of, of their experience, the, the positivity of it. And I want you to tell your story, give your testimony to one person. Now, it can be your husband, your wife, a friend, a family member. I'm not saying you got to go out in the street and find someone that you don't know to do it. It's really hard for people to do. But let's start practicing our testimony. And if you're more comfortable practicing on people that we, um, that we know, then, then let's go ahead and practice on people that we do know. Does that make sense? But all of you, at least one time, call someone and give your testimony. Amen? Amen. Let's close. Yivrecha Adonai v'yishmerecha, ya'ar Adonai panavalecha v'yikunecha, yisha Adonai panavalecha v'yashemlecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you very much.